Welcome to the last. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Oh, good. Thank you. Um, well, welcome to the last uh, half day of the conference. Terrific conference. Thanks to the organisers, by the way. It must have been an awful lot of work. So thank you. Uh, well, we start with uh, Frank Jackson talking about Lewis metaphysics first. Frank. What are the most frightening words to hear at the beginning of a philosophy talk? <laughs> I don't need a microphone. <laughs> <laughs> so, can everyone hear me? Because I'm just going to talk, I'm not going to orate. Okay. And just while the philosophy starts, can I just echo what Hugh has just said? Um, this conference is a great idea, the project's a great idea, and when it's finished, It'll be a real contribution to philosophy and the world of ideas. So I just want to signal, uh, I know some of the names, I mean, Helen and Anthony and Fraser, but I know there's a whole lot of other people. Um, so I don't want you to think we haven't noticed what a huge contribution you're making. I guess that's what I'm saying. All right. Now for the easy part, the philosophy. Okay. <laughs> Here's what we're going to do. We're going to talk about how to make overall sense of Lewisian views about language, belief, the necessary a posteriori, the de se, twin earth, conceptual analysis. Now, as Hugh said to me when he read the abstract, that sounds like a hell of a lot for 45 minutes. But actually, what I'm going to say is, if you start in the right place, everything falls into place. So it's one simple little package deal, okay? So here we go. I may not quite get to the end, we'll just see. Hugh will keep an eye on me, okay? So you will. All right. So we've got to find the right place to start. Right at the beginning of the Tractatus, Wittgenstein makes a couple of famous remarks. Some of you will have read them. Some people won't. Here they are. The world is all that is the case. The world is the totality of facts, not of things. Okay. No. <laughs> the world is a huge, big thing spread out in space and time, with plenty of things in them, <laughs> related thus and so to each other. That's the Lewisian starting point. Okay. That's what there is. This thing, I'm standing in a bit of it. Why is that true? Give me a spade. Actually, it's a bit implausible. Pretend I'm standing in the garden. <laughs> Give me a spade and I can dig a hole in it. <laughs> and I won't be able to dig holes in states of affairs or facts. So that's where Lewis started from. And when I say where Lewis started from, uh, of course, I think, I mean, I'm taking responsibility for these remarks. I think this is the right place to start, <laughs> absolutely. So there we are. I said all that, haven't I? And there's the picture. So there's us occupying a tiny little bit of this enormous thing, struggling to understand it, struggling to talk about it, struggling to get information about it. Okay. So, what does this tell us? Or perhaps I should say, what, is, what does this suggest about words and sentences? Well, what it suggests is this. The most important things about words and sentences is the way they give information about this huge thing we're occupying. That's the crucial thing. There it is. Words and sentences inform us about this huge thing. Have I put it on the slide? Tell us about it in the sense of giving information about it. Or at least they do if we understand the words. If someone utters a sentence in Japanese to me, I learn something, namely, they're speaking a language I don't understand, <laughs> but I won't learn much about um, the curvature of space-time or where the nearest coffee shop is. So what we have to be, we have to be confronted with sentences in a language we understand. When that happens, we learn something about the kind of world we occupy. Okay. Just hammering this point home, it'll be so important. What happened in 1905? Well, we know what happened. Einstein changed our view about the kind of world we occupy. Okay. 
You might say, what made Einstein a great scientist is he was a wonderful hunter down of true propositions. Well, no doubt he was, but the crucial thing was actually he transformed our view about the kind of world we occupy. Okay? And where propositions fit into that story, another question. But the most important thing is what he told us about the world we occupy. In German, in fact, so I can see one person at the back who might have got something out of the German versions. <laughs> so we all read it in translation, don't we? And more mundane example, climate change. See, here's where I'm getting the point across. Why are we frightened when we hear those sentences from people talking about climate change? I'm terrified this proposition is true. Now, this is what frightens us. Mm. What frightens us is how the world would have to be if what they're saying is true. That's what's frightening, isn't it? Okay. Get the idea? This is the world-focused way of thinking. So, there's that question. How should we represent this world-focused, information-first way of thinking? Now, see, I've got in a bit of trendy jargon. You know, in ethics now, they talk of reasons first. In epistemology, they talk of knowledge first. So, I'm joining the party. <laughs> information first. Okay, just gives you a tag phrase to get the general idea. Now, the answer I'm going to give is very familiar. We should represent this information-first approach in terms of partitions. In the case of simple short words like the word table, it'll be partitions of objects. In the case of sentences, like the sentence, there are electrons, it'll be partitions of possible worlds, logical space. Now you'll see that little, see that long hyphen? <laughs> and the words, first pass only, <laughs> That's to warn you, of course, that I'm going to tell the really simple story in terms of partitions, and then near the end I'll say, actually, it's a bit more complicated than that. But the good news is it's not that much more complicated. Okay. So we're going to do it the easy way first, and then we'll do the complication at the end. <coughs> so, question, how does the word table deliver information? And by table, by the way, I mean one of these. <laughs> I don't mean a table of numbers. Okay. This is not part of the talk. You, you know, when you're writing a philosophy paper, you want a good example of an ambiguous word. And we're all terribly boring, right? Doesn't word bank, don't we? <laughs> now, a good friend of mine said, why are we being so boring? Why don't you use the word table? So from now on, I'm going to use the word table. Okay, so it's ambiguous in this. Okay. So that's not part of the talk. It's just, okay. That rectangle represents all the objects there are, or maybe all the objects there might be, that difference is not going to matter here. And there it is. And that funny squash circle, that represents the extension of the word table. Okay? So the objects inside the funny looking thing, they are all the objects to which the word table applies. Okay, is someone clear what the picture is saying? Okay. Now, I'm now going to ask you a question about the picture. And I mean, I'm going to ask you to answer it. I don't mean I'm going to ask you to stick your hand up and utter the answer, but I'm going to ask you to think to yourselves what answer you'd give. Okay. There's that question. Do the items to which table applies, that is the items in the extension of the word table, have anything interesting in common over and above the fact that the word table applies to them? So if you want to take a moment to think about their answer, I'm going to give you my answer and I'm going to make a prediction. Nearly everybody will agree with my answer, okay? But maybe not quite everybody, but nearly everybody, okay? So, here we go. The answer is yes. <laughs> People who give the answer no, if you want to label for them, you might call them quietists. So the Professional philosophers in the audience will know exactly where that word's coming from, won't you? <laughs> but I'm saying, yes, there is something in common. What's in common? Well, this thing and this thing is different from this thing. And the difference is not words. Okay? That's the difference. And in fact, this fact, that there's something more in common, is crucial to the informational value of the word table. Because the word table is not giving you information about words. When you hear the word table, 
course, you learn something about words. I mean, you just come across a token of the word table. But you actually learn something about the kind of furniture in the room, don't you? And the key to the informational value of the word table lies in the fact that the answer to our question up there is yes. What the objects have in common is they're all the right way for the word table to apply to them. So you can see how that informational picture is coming into the picture. There we are. And it's our grasp of what that way is that explains the informational value of the word. Okay, you've heard the story for table, now you can guess what's coming. I'm going to tell you the same story, the sentence, and then I'm going to make things a tiny bit more complicated. But okay, here's the same story for sentence, and I'm hoping that the story for table is so simple and easy you can almost guess what the story for sentence is going to be. Okay, but here we go. This time the rectangle is logical space. That's the complete set of all the complete ways things might be, of which the thing we're standing is is one example. There it is, logical space, as it's often called. And this time, the squash circle is the set of worlds which are the right way for the sentence to be true. And that's one and the same as a set of worlds where the sentence is true. So the sentence is, there are electrons. How does a world have to be for that sentence to be true? We all know the answer to that question, don't we? There better be some electrons in it. Okay. And just talking a bit more about this example, what's in common throughout that squash circle is that every world there has electrons. If our sentence is the sentence, there are electrons. But the worlds, of course, will differ one from another, and that's because the sentence, there are electrons, is silent about a lot of matters. So, for example, the sentence doesn't say whether Manchester is bigger than Birmingham or whether Birmingham is bigger than Manchester. And you capture this in this way of thinking by having some of the worlds, Manchester's bigger than Birmingham, some of the worlds, Birmingham's bigger than Manchester. The one thing that's in common is the electrons. That's the idea. <coughs> and mutatis mutandis for belief. On this way of thinking about things, you think of belief as a state that represents the kind of world we occupy, and the content of belief on this way of thinking will be a set of worlds, all the worlds which are as the belief represents things to be. And of course, the belief and sentence story have to go hand in hand, because if you say what happened when we read Einstein's sentences, is we acquired a view about which kind of world we're in, then of course what happened was you actually believed Einstein, didn't you? So you better say the same thing for the sentences you're saying for belief. All right. Now, when is S true simpliciter? And this part's really easy. And so easy, I'll just fill up quickly. The sentence S is true simpliciter when the, when the worlds which are the right way for S to be true include the actual world, obviously. So now we can give you a simple little correspondence theory of truth. Here it goes. It's a kind of correspondence theory of truth, but it's for sentences, not propositions. Lewis was not a supporter of the correspondence theory of truth for propositions. And this is a correspondence theory for sentences. And secondly, and perhaps more importantly, and this connects with themes earlier in this conference, there are no tailor-made facts. So the story about how the sentence, there are electrons, gets to be true, is not that there's a fact. Remember, in English, you can take a sentence, there are electrons, and make a sort of naming word out of it, can't you? Here's how I do it. There are electrons, that's a sentence. The state of affairs of there being electrons. See, you just take the is and turn a being and shove something in front, and you've made a naming expression. Uh, now, you might think, gee, isn't it easy to make things? I just take a sentence and do a little grammatical, and suddenly I've created these states of affairs, and my goodness, that state of affairs is waiting to make the sentence, there are electrons, true. Isn't that, isn't that nice of it? Because I wanted to make the sentence true, because it is true, and I've done it, just like that. Now, on the Lewisian way of thinking, and you can tell by the way I'm saying it all, I agree with Lewis about this, that's the wrong story. This connects with something that's come, things come up. The right way to think about it is, how come the sentence is true, is that it carves out a region in logical space, and inside that region is the way things actually are. That's the story. No story about Tyler Bad Facts. Okay. All right. 
Now things are going to get a little bit more complicated. I've been talking about how things would have to be for a sentence to be true, how a thing would have to be for the word table to apply to it. But of course, how things would have to be is one thing. Our knowledge of how things would have to be is another, isn't it? Two different topics, just as I've said there on the slide. Now, although they're two different topics, we better have a hell of a lot of the second. Okay. Now, why is that? The reason is the importance of hypothetical deduction. Remember what happens in hypothetical deduction? Here's one way things might be. And that's the way, this is what we can expect. Here's another way things might be. That's right, that's what we can expect. You know how it goes. And then, now, I wonder what happens on the bottom. You know what happens? That hypothesis, look for, ah, oh, we did get those results. Well, we didn't get those. You know, you know, I don't need to give you a philosophy of science, 101 lecture on argument for the best explanation and how wonderful Conan Doyle was. You all know that story. Now, the crucial thing is that whole process would be a complete nonsense if you didn't know what the words were standing for. How can you possibly have an opinion about what sort of experimental results you'd get if, and then you produce all of sentences if you didn't know what the sentence stood for? Okay. So that's why it's not just there has to be a way things have to be for the sentence to be true. We better, in lots of cases, know what it is. Okay. And you'll see this simple observation makes trouble in a second. Okay. There we are. I've said all that, haven't I? And there it is. If you want to see a few letters on the screen, I've used H for the hypotheses with great originality. <laughs> An E for the putative experiment <coughs> results. That's, I, that's all pretty straightforward, isn't it? Is anyone wanting to go even slower? I think we're going fine so far. But I give you a warning, it's now getting slightly more. This generates a problem. It's a very simple little story, OK? okay. <coughs> now, here's the, here's the problem. What have I called the slide? A puzzle. There's a puzzle now for those who hold that the sentence, any water is H2O, is necessarily true. And I'm one of them. I, I think that sentence is necessarily true. Um, Here's the puzzle. In the 1700s, the key experiments that showed that water was H2O occurred in the late 1700s, early 1800s. Okay. Now, the crucial point is, in the 1700s, before they knew that water was H2O, they described their experiments using the word water. Well, actually, a number of them were French. They used another word, but we're going to... Is it Cavendish was the English person who was the big player, I think? So we'll just pretend they all spoke English. They described their experiments using the word water. Now, when they wrote to each other saying, I'm going to carry out this experiment, what the people received was a passage of prose containing the word water. Now, of course, they weren't carrying out experiments on words. <laughs> they were carrying out experiments on words, what words stand for. But they didn't know that water was H2O. That was the end of the story, not the beginning. So we have to tell a story about what it was they acquired by way of information when they came across the word water doing those experiments. Get the idea? All right. That's what we have to say. OK, now what did they acquire? There's that question. Right. Now, you can all guess the answer I'm going to give you. It's so obvious I'm not going to bother putting up the slide. The information they acquired concerned the watery stuff. And if you want to know what the watery stuff is, it's roughly speaking what you find in a dictionary, isn't it? Or if you haven't got a dictionary nearby, open any paper by David Chalmers. <laughs> it means potable, liquid stuff, and so on and so forth. Okay. If everyone knows that, don't they? You can have a bit of an argy-bargy about just how to spell it out, but that's roughly what you find. And in case, I mean, I actually have opened the dictionary and looked. It actually is what you find in the dictionary. <laughs> All right, now... There we are, that's it. So now we've got our problem. Mm -hmm. And I've said, I believe that sentence up the top, any water is H2O is necessarily true. But of course, nobody thinks that the watery stuff is H2O is necessarily true, do they? So what are we going to say? That's the problem. Okay. Now, here's how we solve that problem. Answer. There are two parts to the answer. One says that the word water is the rigid designator of the watery stuff. Okay. And the other says that H2O <coughs> is the rigid designator of H2O. Now, those are two semantic theses about words in English. 
or they could be French, but we're talking English. Put those two semantic theses together, and of course you can see why that sentence comes out as necessarily true. Because it's true of the actual world, and if the designators are rigid, that means it's going to be true everywhere, doesn't it? So there's the story. Now, you can then have an argy-bargy about what's the best explanation of the fact that those words are rigid. If you want my private opinion, the best explanation is that the word water is a kind of rigidified description. And in the case of the word, or the phrases, phrase, H2O, the answer does need to advert to the fact that being H2O is an essential property. So it's not just a semantic issue. But that's a separate question. Now put those two together, and then we've got a story about how come that sentence is necessarily true, despite the fact that it's a posteriori. And what's the take-home message? Well, there it is on the slide. The upshot is there's no way, no need to think in the two-space way about the necessary a posteriori. Now, what do I mean by the two-space way? Well, you got a glimpse of it yesterday in Johnson's talk. But let me just make it explicit. You've all been to these talks where the PowerPoint goes up and there's a huge big rectangle described as the space of what's conceptually possible. That was the phrase that Jonathan used yesterday. Some people like to call it the space of what's epistemically possible. That's a big one. And through there, sometimes there are worlds where water's not H2O. Okay? And then there's a smaller rectangle, gets labelled the space of what's metaphysically possible. That's inside a proper subset. And throughout there, water's H2O. That's how it goes. I'm hoping many of you have been to these PowerPoint presentations. And if Bob Stornak is in the audience, although Bob and I disagree about a lot, he doesn't like these diagrams. <laughs> Other people, okay. The message here, though, the little story I've told you, which I think is basically a little Lewisian story, there's no two-space stuff about this. It's a single space of worlds. It's a story which appeals to semantics to explain why the sentence gets me a story. Notice I haven't had to tell you about the diagonal proposition and the a priori knowledge of meanings and all that complicated stuff that Michaela's talked about very interestingly. It's that easy. Oh, so say I. Okay, all right. Oh, we're doing nasty, but how? Have about 20 minutes to go? Yeah. Okay, all right. We may not get to conceptual analysis because I'm determined to do the stuff on day say because they're nice pictures, okay? <laughs> Remember I said right at the beginning, here's the simple way of doing the informational picture of language and words, partitions, okay? Partitions of objects, in the case of a word like table. Partitions of possible worlds, in the case of a sentence like there are electrons. Okay. Now we come to the bit where you have to complicate the story. And basically the reason you have to complicate the story are the reasons that Lewis gives that wonderful day say paper. But that day say paper is not an easy read. Um, I mean, I've been in this business for a long time, and I did not find it an easy read. I think I'd be slightly, I you could say, well, just because Frank found it a hard read doesn't mean I won't find it an easy read, but <laughs> lots of very good philosophers read that paper and come away with quite different messages, and in some cases, in my opinion, they've completely misunderstood the paper, and they're jolly good philosophers. So, that's an empirical <laughs> argument for saying it's hard, okay? <laughs> but it doesn't have to be hard, so what I'm now going to tell you is how to get the guts, in my opinion, of that paper with really easy examples, okay? No two God stuff, no getting lost in libraries and complicated expressions. Okay, let's go. You all sit. It's the World Cup, okay? I'm the team captain. You late tossed the coin at the beginning. And I name the coin I toss before each game Lucky. Okay, so the lucky, lucky is a proper name. I mean, I may have chosen that name because of a certain nice history it's got, but it's a proper name, okay? I put it in my sports bag, all right? My rival replaces the coin with a duplicate. Looks just the same, exactly the same weight. Right? Okay. Can't tell it apart, okay? Pops in the bag without my logic, okay? At the next toss, I pull out the replacement coin. Not that I know it's the replacement coin. And I hold it up and utter the following sentence. Is there on the slide? This is lucky. Okay, is everyone clear about the example? I've gone slow enough, because it's important. Okay, now I'm going to ask you a question, right? Now, I'm going to be stick my neck out all the way this time. Uh, remember I said I thought most of you would agree with the answer I gave for the previous question, but there might be one or two dissenters. I'm going to bet that 100% of you agree with the answer I'm about to give you, okay? 
There we are. No. <laughs> so I, I went too fast, didn't I? The question is, have I spoken truly? <laughs> and the answer is no. Is, is there anyone who thinks that's the wrong answer? Does anyone want to say yes? Yeah, right. Ah, well, okay, right. Uh, I, thank you. <laughs> Let's talk about that in discussion. That, that's a good question to ask. Okay. <laughs> okay, so I'm saying the answer is no, and you should all agree with me. <laughs> and apart from this very experienced customer here who's thinking about hexaides or something. <laughs> okay. um, a, a way to bring out the fact that the answer <coughs> is no is imagine someone protesting as follows Look, I'm a big fan of rigidified description theories of proper names. The descriptions the two coins satisfy the same. So it's got to be true. Now, isn't it just obvious that no matter how sympathetic you were to a rigidified description of kind of proper names, that person is going down the wrong path. Okay, you would sort of see, you'd have to say, look, I'm terribly sorry, I may share your sympathies, but something's gone wrong here, hasn't it? Okay. Okay, now what's the explanation? Well, I'm hoping you all think, look, this is an easy case. We know what the explanation is. There's a day say element in my use of the word lucky. When I produce the word lucky, I'm using it as a word for a coin that shares a certain causal history with me. And the replacement coin doesn't. There's really no mystery about why the sentence this is lucky is false. It's because the coin I hold up when I say this is lucky is a coin which does not have the right causal history with me. Okay. Okay, so that Easy. Now, I'm hoping for something else. I'm hoping some of you at least are thinking, hold on, I haven't come across the lucky story before, but haven't I come across somewhere back in 1970 or something a story which has got certain similarities with this one? Now, what's it called again? Twin Earth. Okay. I'm hoping some of you will be thinking, I think there's a certain structural similarity between the story that's just been told and the famous Twin Earth story. Now, the answer is yes, there is, and let's start it out. And this will tell you what, in my opinion, was Lewis's attitude towards Twin Earth, actually. Okay. Okay, here we go. The one on the left is Earth, and the one on the right is Twin Earth. The smiley face in the middle is in the traveller who goes from Earth to Twin Earth. Remember the early paper? A journal philosophy paper, not the big, huge Putnam meaning of meaning paper, the short one. Uh, person travels from Earth to Twin Earth. The travelling occurs before it was known that the stuff on Earth was H2O and the stuff on Twin Earth was XYZ. And what happens, of course, is that the traveller hops on the spaceship or whatever it is, gets off at Twin Earth, and he or she looks around, and of course the stuff on Twin Earth looks exactly the same as the stuff on Earth, doesn't it? So what happens? We know what's going to happen. The person's going to say, there's lots of water, aren't they? They're going to use the very same word, OK? That's, you know, that, this is just reminding you of that famous old example, OK? Now, here's our question. Like the question about lucky, except it's rephrased for Earth and Twin Earth. Does a traveller from Earth to Twin Earth, before it was known that the watery stuff on the two planets are different kinds, Speak truly when they call the watery stuff on Twin Earth water. That was the question Putnam put to us back in the 1970s, wasn't it? Okay. And you can see how it's really very like the question about Lucky. Okay. Now, the question about Lucky, I said with some confidence, and there was a sort of tiny dissent from over there from John, <laughs> that you'd all agree there was one answer, it was the answer I liked. Okay, okay. easy. Now, it's a matter of record. There is not one answer given by philosophers to that. Highly intelligent, informed people, when asked that question there, give three different answers, actually. That's just a matter of record, OK? Now, of course, some people get really upset, and so they ought to give just one answer. <laughs> but the fact is, they do give three different answers. There we are. Now, one group, I guess this is probably the majority orthodox group, group containing Putnam, said, no, our traveller does not speak truly when they say there's water around here when they look out on Twin Earth, OK? But of course, there's also a group of people who say, now look, it was this bloke Putnam 
you told me about multiple realizability. I think that's terrific stuff. And I know what to say about this. This illustrates that water is multiple realizable. Now, I mean, thank heavens, if I hadn't read Putnam, I would have thought the answer was no. But now I've read Putnam and the answer is yes. I mean, this is actually slightly a bit of ironical part of the history of philosophy, isn't it? So many people insist that Putnam got the right when he said no, but actually, if you read other bits of Putnam, it rather suggests the answer is yes. Okay, all right. And then there's a third group, and it was Lewis belonged to the third group. Lewis said, look, our usage of the word water is simply indeterminate between the usage, which gives the answer no, and the usage that gives the answer yes. Okay. Now, on Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays, I believe, David, about that, on Tuesdays and Thursdays, I'm more of a no answer person. <laughs> but the important point for us is, if you're a no answer person, what's happening is you're giving a day say element to the use of the word water. You're using the word water to name something which shares a certain history with us. And what happens when the traveller arrives on twin earth is the stuff he's coming across or she's coming across on twin earth is not the stuff they've got that shared history with. So we've got another illustration of the importance of a day say. Get the idea? Just the same thing. Right. All right. Now, when I talked about information more generally, I said, how should we represent? And I talked in terms of partitions. Okay. Now, what I've been telling you is, got to acknowledge the day say, and I'm hoping the examples I've given are rather easy to understand than getting lost in libraries and so on. So here's our question. How should we represent the informational value of the day say? That's our question. Okay. All right. All right. That's our question. Now, I'm going to tackle that question by telling you yet another story. It's an easy story. Okay. It's a story inspired by things that people like Kaplan and Perry have said, but it's a story that's right through the literature. There are various versions of the story I'm about to tell you. I mean, I've been outrageous and grabbed from all over the place to make up my one, okay? So, what I'm saying is this story is totally unoriginal. Right? But I've, I've tried to get a really nice, crisp, easy version. All right, here we go. Here's the story. <coughs> uh, I'll, I'll connect you to the day say in a sec. Just, just focus on the story for a moment. <laughs> here we go. I'm looking at a clean mirror, but think I'm looking out a window. Okay. It's important the mirror is clean, because if it was grubby, of course, I could tell that I was looking in the mirror, couldn't I? See the sponges, okay. So I'm looking at a clean mirror, but think I'm looking out a window, OK? I see someone being approached from behind by a trick or treater. You can tell I wrote this slide round about Halloween, OK? The someone is me, but I do not realise it, OK? And there's the picture, right? That, that's what I see, right? Now, it's very important that everyone's really clear about... My, no, uh, the reason I'm really slowed down now is it's really important everyone's absolutely clear what the example is. Because I'm going to ask a, set, a question in a sec, which is, I have to say, a bit harder than the question I've been asking so far. Okay. This much is true. This is not hard, this is the easy bit. <laughs> this much is clearly true. I believe, and I may well say, I believe and say... <laughs> that someone is being approached from behind by a trick or treater, okay? So what do I believe? Someone's being approached from behind by a trick or treater. What sentence will I produce? Open the inverted commas. Someone is being approached from behind by a trick or treater. Close the inverted commas, okay? And when I produce that sentence, I'm producing a true sentence, okay? I'm hoping everyone thinks it's just obvious the sentence is true. So this is the easy bit, all right? All right, now it's the hard bit. <coughs> Is my saying and belief about myself? This is the hard question. Okay. I've just said something true. I've got a true belief. Is the belief and saying about myself? That's the question. Okay. And now I'm going to do what philosophers often do, but I'd like to avoid it whenever possible, but I'm going to do it. <laughs> one sense yes and one sense no. <laughs> but I hope you'll see that this is not one of those terrible, dodgy ways when a philosopher in trouble immediately distinguishes in order to avoid getting in trouble, OK? That you'll see there's an intuitive plausibility when I say there are two ways of reading the question. OK, here we go. In one sense, yes. The someone is me, 
and I'm in an information carrying causal relationship with myself. Think of people who distinguish de dicto belief from de re belief, stuff that goes back to Quine and beyond. Remember the de re ones are the ones where you say, I believe of A that it is F. And the de dicto ones are the ones where you say, I believe that A is F and all that stuff. People who talk about the de re sense often insist plausibly that the crucial thing about the de re ones is you're a kind of causal information preserving acquaintance sort of relationship with the rays in question, don't they? So that line of thought says, right, in some sense I've got to believe that myself because I am indeed in a kind of acquaintance relationship with myself. Okay? So I'm hoping I've said enough to convince you that in one sense the answer jolly well is yes. Okay? So I've said enough? Okay. Now the hard bit is for me to try and convince you that the other sense is perfectly intelligible and there's a sense in which the answer is no. Okay? So, in fact, I'm going to do it with this machine before I do it with this machine. Okay. Here's the sense in which the answer is no. I do not believe that I belong to the class of people being approached from behind by a trick or treater. I'll say that again. I do not believe that I belong to the class of people being approached from behind by a trick or treater. That sound right to me? I think that's obvious. That's clearly true. I don't have the appropriate class membership belief. So in that sense, I do not have a belief about myself. That's the idea. There we are. In what sense is the answer? No, there it is. I do not believe. <coughs> but I belong to the class of people being approached from behind by a trick or treater. So what's the take home message? Well there is on the top, as well as beliefs and sayings about the kind of world we occupy, we have beliefs and sayings about the kind of person we are, in whichever world it is that we occupy. Because what happens in the example of the previous slide is I fail to have a certain kind of belief about the kind of person I'm in the world I occupy. What sense do I believe I'm one of the bald ones? I believe in whichever world I occupy, I belong to the class of people who's bald, don't I? Okay. Rather painful belief that comes on, you know, you resist it for a while and then you just give up. Okay. Um, all right. Now, how should we represent these beliefs, which are beliefs about the kind of person, or if you like, the set you belong to, in whichever world it is that you occupy? How do you represent those? Here's how it goes. That big rectangle is, as before, logical space, but now those squash circles are not regions of logical space. Those squash circles are possible worlds. And those possible worlds have things in them, of course. And the happy faces are the things that are the right way, whatever belief it is, and the unhappy faces are the things that are the wrong way. So the unhappy ones are the red ones, and the happy ones are the Happy faces just mean, in the world where I'm a happy face, I'm the right kind of thing to be whatever kind of thing it is. That's what's happening. So when you've got a belief about the kind of thing you are, in whatever world it is you occupy, what you believe is, if it's happy faces, you're one of those, or maybe one of those. But you're not one of those, you're not one of those. That's what happens. In here, well, none of those are the right way because it's empty. So when this happens, let's see what happens. Let's go from a happy face. See the happy face? There it is, happy face. Happy face and world. I'm shaking my thing a bit too much, too far away. Um, happy face and world. What's that going to go to? If I go from that face to that world, what am I going to end up in? Anyone tell me. Truth. I don't know. See what happens? This one, okay, you can do this one. This one and this world, what's going to happen? Falsity. But don't hold back. <laughs> See, what's happening is, by looking at it in the class membership way, what we're inducing is a function that takes us from individuals and worlds, truth or falsity, depending on whether or not the individual belongs to the appropriate class in the world in question. Get the idea? I'll say it all again. When you think in the class membership way, you're thinking you've got beliefs about the class you belong to and you have a world you're in. What you do is you induce a function that goes from an individual to a world, to truth, just if that individual belongs to the relevant class in that world. Get the idea? So what I've told you is that thinking in terms of class membership 
it's just the same way as thinking in terms of functions on individual and world truth values. And of course, we all know individuals to worlds and truth values, they're also centered worlds, aren't they? And we all know that's the same thing as Lewis called description of properties. It's four, is it four? Yeah, four different ways <laughs> of saying essentially the same thing. Okay? And it's, it's that easy. And I say it the class membership way just because I think that's such an easy way of thinking about it. Um, if, well, oh, actually, we didn't go uh, If you like David Chalmers and you've got a background, a strong background in mathematics, you know, these people, functions from individuals and worlds of truth values that are trip off the tongue, and before you know where you are, there's lots of fancy symbols, and it's, it's all terrific stuff. <laughs> but, but if you want to think about it in ordinary English and seeing things in mirrors, I think the way to think about it is just to think about it in terms of beliefs or sayings about what class you belong to and whichever world you're in. Now, that finishes the day, say, and I think we can skip conceptual analysis. That's, we've got enough to talk about. We've just about reached the 45 minutes, haven't we? Not quite. We've got a couple of minutes left. Well, why don't I just give you the first slide of conceptual analysis, then I'll shut up. How's that? Then you guys can have a go. All right, there we are. Oh, sorry. And if you wonder, does Lewis ever say in the way you can think of as class membership, have a look at that paper there. Right there. He's talking about perception, but the message goes through. All right, here's the last thing, concept analysis, and I'll just say, here we are. That's actually, that was good. Here's the world's fastest introduction to conceptual analysis. <laughs> you know what they say in cognitive science, that human beings are pattern-recognising machines? Okay. As I say on the second dot point there, it's a fact about our world that there are patterns. I mean, thank God, otherwise we couldn't master the world. In fact, we wouldn't exist. <laughs> so what we do is we master the world by spotting patterns and predicting them. That's what economists do when they think about housing bubbles. The climate scientists, you know, you've all seen those zigzaggy graphs? <coughs> They're pattern hunting. And the guys that I think are the good guys, and I'm using guys in the gender inclusive sense, ones that I think are the good guys are the ones who say the patterns go that way, aren't they? <laughs> Whereas the bad guys are saying that they're going that way, okay? You know all that story. Okay, so pattern recognition is crucial. Now, what this tells us is, suppose you find that people have got some words and concepts that are really rather good at predicting and explaining things. Well, I wonder what pattern they're picking out. Obvious question, isn't it? So I've just said patterns are the key to understanding the world, or well, often. These people have got words and concepts which gives them a really quite surprising ability to predict and explain. They must be spotting a pattern. And of course, that's what happens when people use the term belief in the so, isn't it? And then what the conceptual analysis person does is, let me spell the pattern out for you. But there's nothing more mysterious than that. There's none of this nonsense, I shouldn't put this strongly, but of there being concepts like glass balls being shot at and broken down into clause one, clause two, clause three. We've all seen that mockery of conceptual analysis. And maybe for some historical versions of conceptual analysis, that was fair enough. But that's not the way to think about it. What's happening in conceptual analysis, people are making explicit in words the patterns that underline various practices using words and concepts. We know the patterns are there because they predict things that they couldn't otherwise do. So even photo, photo ops this way and den it this way, about as far apart as you can get, really. <laughs> but I sometimes feel I'm sort of stuck a bit in the middle. But um, they agree about that much, don't they? And so they should. Okay, one last example just for fun, just so I can tell you away with you. You know the police sometimes call for witnesses <coughs> to robberies? Why on earth do they do that? Well, because witnesses to robberies tend to know rather a lot about them, don't they? That's using personal identity as a predictor and explainer, because a witness to a robbery is one and the same person as the person reporting on, isn't it? So when the police say, if you saw this robbery come into the office, the person who turns up in the office is the very same person, hopefully, as the person who witnessed the robbery. That reminds us that personal identity is a good explainer and predictor. And then we better give an analysis of personal identity which makes sense of that. Okay. Last comment. If it's all pattern spotting, then here's a good thought. That's really on the slide. Why get locked into the patterns that our existing words and concepts picked out? Why not be a little bit adventurous? And what's the name for being a little bit adventurous? Conceptual engineering. <laughs> And I think that Lewis would have been perfectly happy with it. But as many of you all know, he was in many ways, both philosophically and in other ways, a conservative person. 
So it would have been moderate conceptual engineering, but I think on this way of thinking about conceptual analysis, which I think really is what Lewis is often on about, uh, conceptual engineering is just fine. Thank you.